Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to call to order the October 21st meeting of the Frederick County Planning Commission. That's 2015. Um, we have, uh, we, let me, let me uh, <coughs> just quickly suggest if you would join us in a moment of silence, please. Thank you very much. We need to uh, adopt our agenda, which has not changed. Madam Chair, I move for adoption. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed. Thank you. Uh, we have um, citizen, excuse me, uh, committee reports. Let me get to that. And uh, could we start with Chris Mullen with comprehensive plans and programs? Yes, Madam Chair, the uh, committee met uh, back on October 12th last week, and uh, we kicked off the uh, citizen uh, review panels for the 2035 comprehensive plan update, and uh, those different groups will be broken down by the different land use components. So the groups will be doing their work over the next uh, several weeks, and we'll keep the ball moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, next, Mr. Chuck Dunlap, who... Uh, Hey, uh, uh, the resources, the yeah. yeah, thank you. The uh, HR AB met uh, last evening. Uh, the items discussed were uh, the rezoning application in the process for 81 West Business Park and the 2035 comprehensive plan update. Uh, with regard to the, re the proposed rezoning, the consensus of the committee was that the application has no impact on the Robinson Klein house, which is an historic house. Uh, it's located near the, the application property, but, but not adjacent. Uh, there was a general discussion on the 2035 plan, uh, comp plan update. Uh, number of uh, questions and discussions about the role of the HRB, HRAB in implementing the, the elements of the plan and the uh, committee will summarize their comments and questions and so forth and send it to the CPPC. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Greg Unger for the Sanitation Authority. Uh, yes, ma'am. We met last night. Uh, this is for the month of September. Uh, the total customer base for water is 14,429. Sanitary is 13,941. Rainfall for the month of September was 3.83. Uh, previous month was 1.8, so that was up a little bit, and we're still doing real good as far as an average is concerned. Uh, we drew 1.9 million gallon a day from the deal plant. For water, uh, we drew 2.0 2 million gallon per day from the Anderson plant. We purchased 1.6 million gallon per day from the city. And daily average is about 5.6, which is pretty normal for this time of year. Percentage of the system's capacity right now is about 75%, so we still got about 25% of our capacity that we can still use. Uh, the deal plant in Stephen City's elevation was down about two feet. The Anderson plant was down just about the same. It was about two feet. And the unaccountable water for last month was about 18%, which is high, but they feel like they may have made a mistake in some of the numbers they were working with, and they felt like it was more than single digits. So they're going to work on that and see if they can give a better report next month. Uh, that well that we dug in Lake Frederick is producing between 350 and 500,000 gallon of water per uh, day, which is a very good well for, you know, just stuck out there and we're real happy with that. We've also got another well close to that area that's going to produce about 100,000 gallon of water per day. So. We've got a pretty good water source down there. It should be in operation within a year or so. We'll be using from that soon. Uh, down at Round Hill, we still don't have a well site picked out. Uh, they're working on that. We do have, we are gonna try to get a well down there or get one if it's productive, but we still don't have a site for it yet. So we're working on that also. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Mr. Hess, the board meet. 
Uh, Madam Chairman, you can just splice in my report from the previous meeting as the board has not met since the last uh, Planning Commission meeting, but uh, we are scheduled to meet next Wednesday. Excellent. Thank you. And Ms. Martha Schickel from the City of Winchester. The Planning Commission did not meet either. Okay. Thank you. All righty. Um, this is the time on our agenda where we ask for citizen comments for anything except that which is a public hearing. And it seems that we have seven public hearings tonight, so that if you're interested in any of those items, you can speak to it when they come up. But if you have something else that you'd like to share with us, we'd certainly welcome your comments. Anybody? Well, seeing no one, we will um, close the uh, citizen comment portion. This is a public hearing. It is a conditional use permit uh, 03-15 for Gary Rogers Ardress for a cottage occupation uh, dealing with the sale of sheds. The property is located at 1518 White po uh, Fairfax Pike, White Post, Virginia, and the property is identified with property identification number 87-A-A. 12D in the Opekin Magisterial District. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chairman, <laughs> members of the uh, Planning Commission. Uh, this, this property uh, currently is owned RA, rural areas, and its use is residential. It's surrounded by um, RA properties that are used for residential, and in the rear it's M1, which is a manufa our manufacturing district. If I could turn your attention to a uh, map on the left. Give you an idea where this property is located on uh, 277. Uh, the property is an 11 acre uh, uh, parcel. And this is the uh, house um, where the, the residents where the Ajaris's live. Um, this is the uh, garage which uh, this where this conditional use permit will be taking place. And I'll get into more of that as, as, as we present this uh, case in front of you. The, uh, pro the applicant uh, was looking to assemble sheds and also sell sheds on this property as a, as a conditional use permit uh, for cottage occupation. Uh, it's his business plan, basically, uh, most of the sales of the sheds are by internet basis. However, the applicant would like to have an opportunity to have uh, folks, if they order it, customers to come to the property, and it will be uh, mentioned as conditions. The uh, construction or I should say assembly of the sheds as they come, will be uh, in a uh, accessory structure, which is a garage. Actually, it's a, uh, an approximately 1,500 square foot garage at the rear of the property. Should the uh, Planning Commission um, find this application for the sale of sheds, cottage occupation to be appropriate, staff will recommend the following conditions be assigned to this conditional use permit. Number one, all review agency comments and requirements shall be complied with at all times. Number two, no more than five customers at one time on the site. Number three, no more than seven sheds for display shall, or sales shall be allowed on the properties, and the sheds shall be kept in the rear of the property. Number four, an illustrious sketch plan shall be submitted to and approved by Frederick County, and all the plan improvements shall be implemented prior to operating the business. And for your um, edification, this is the first conditional use permit we have coming forward that actually has an illustrious sketch plan, which we changed in our ordinance. We had required at one time you know, minor site plans and things of that nature, but this is one of the things for a conditional use permit and some other uh, land use actions that we use. Uh, so that's just so the familiarizer with you. That, that's something new. Uh, there will be one business sign allowed and shall conform to the cottage occupation sign requirements and sign exceed four square feet in size and five feet in height. And any, number six, any expansion or use will require a new conditional use permit. Um, for the record, Madam Chair, Mr. Argeris is here um, to answer any questions you or any of the members of the Planning Commission may have on this conditional use permit. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments? A question of staff. Uh, I understand why condition two is in there, but how would we enforce that? And what, what would we tell the owner to do if he has five customers on site and the sixth and seventh ones stop? Well, again, uh, most of his customers are based. I'm going to let him answer that because, yeah. yeah. Most of them are internet-based internet. and all that, but if there's a – I guess what I'm getting to is we have a condition on there that there's no way we could enforce it, so why would we have it on there? 
we have to, I guess that they, the best answer for that, Mr. Thomas, is to set a baseline. Um, that's, plus it's a cottage occupation too, so it has to be Stand. incidental for what you have going on out there. You know, it's different than a barber shop or something like that where they have two chairs and all that. <coughs> it's just if somebody stops, what are we going to tell them to go out there and chase <coughs> a customer past five off? <coughs> I think we're just setting, okay. <laughs> understand any other questions of mr. chair would the applicant like to address the Commission or does the Commission have any questions of the applicant Madam chair I'm Bruce Downing speaking on behalf of the applicant he's here you have a long agenda we agree with the staff commissions we know of no objections by the neighbors and we're here to answer your questions thank you thank you very much Okay, um, any thoughts about this conditional use permit? Did she open the public hearing? No. We will um, want to uh, ask the public if they have any comments about this to address us now. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Not very good at public speaking, but I'll do the best I can and not take up too much time. Uh, I, I do have a, several things. Would you give us your name, please? Yes, my name is Samantha Smith, and I'm of White Post, Virginia. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, there are several things uh, that I'd like to address. Um, number one thing that concerns me is the speed limit of which this stretch of road is. It is 55 miles an hour on that stretch of road, and I travel that road several times a day with my infant son. Um, and there have been several occasions where there have been close calls in front of this address because people, I guess, are looking for it and they see a shed sitting out there and they almost go past the driveway so they slam on their brakes. And that has caused a lot of concern for me. Now, there are, um, the instances I'm talking about have been close calls because I slow down. I don't follow too close. I keep a buffer zone. And whenever I go through this stretch of road, I actually have slowed down to 45 miles an hour. But the problem is, is the guy behind me gets irritated at going 45 miles an hour, so he speeds up and passes me on a double solid line. I don't think that the speed limit, if this conditional use permit passes, I don't think the speed limit through this area should be 55. I think it should at least be reduced to 45, um, especially since there are, is a high school right up the road, and there are a lot of high school brand new drivers that aren't paying attention, and they do follow too close, and I'm just, I'm worried that there will be an issue of having a major accident in front of this address. Um, there is also my concern of, he ha at this point in time, he has, I didn't personally count, but I would say probably 15 to 20 sheds on this particular lot. Um, at this time, not a single one of those sheds is anchored to the ground, which is a requirement to have storage sheds on a property of over 144 square foot. Now, there's a reason for that rule. Um, I don't exactly know what it is, because I'm not on the board, <laughs> but I would say that those sheds need to be anchored to the ground so that in the case of a natural disaster or something, you don't end up with buildings going all the way down wherever, um, flooding or whatever the case may be. Um, and my last and final point, and then I'll let you all go on with your evening, um, is the fact of whenever he originally opened a business, he was told, I'm sure at that time, he had to put down what the address was and go through zoning. And if you're told at that time not to have, you know, this, that, and the other, or what you can and you can't do, um, going by the rules and regulations, and he's done it for the past year without following the rules and regulations, then by granting a permission to use it with under rules and regulations, who's to say that he's going to follow that? Because he's already broken the rules to begin with. Um, me and myself, that's sort of like t me telling my son, don't jump on the bed, and then whenever he does it, say, well, you can jump on the bed, but only if you don't wear shoes. 
and see how well that works out. I thank you all for your time, and uh, that's it. Thank you. thank you. Thank you for coming. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to this conditional use permit? Anyone? Well, seeing none, we will close the public hearing. Any comments from you, Mark? The um, <clears throat> addressing the speed limit, don't can't address it. I'll just point to the application. Uh, what, what the Department of Transportation said in reviewing this application. Business is small enough now, should it grow any bit, they'll have to put a commercial entrance in. That may require also, if the business would grow on the site, that may kick our site plan requirement in, and, and that would be addressed uh, later. As far as the sheds, the building official has been out there, looked at the, everything is out there. To my knowledge that there's nothing, you know, the certain square footage of shed, of course you need a building permit under a certain square footage, you don't. The business has grown, and, and the the the, um, the applicant did start out as a home occupation. Again, it grew to where it is now, and that's why they're here for the conditional use permit. Again, once we put the, as you're all well aware of, the board approves this conditional use permit, we're stuck there with the seven sheds, the five customers, the business line. So that should alleviate any other issues that that are concerns um, at the, at this property. Yes. Is it? I mean, on the speed limit, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. There are a number of businesses along that, that road there. There's a landscaping, there's a farmer's market. Uh, the farmer's market has many more than five cars there. Uh, you know, and there's, there's the manufacturing business there. So would it be appropriate for us, for us to ask VDOT to look at that to see if the speed limit should be lowered to 45? Take it under consideration. Actually, I think the procedure would be to kick it over transportation committee and they would. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, putting up the sign may alleviate the sudden stops that people see the sign where they're going to turn ahead of time. Like I said, there's a number of other businesses there already. It's turning into a business court, a small business court, which is good. <coughs> Madam Chair, this is in a Peckin district. Yes. Uh, I looked at the site. I think it's a, a good use. It's a it's a good business. Uh, I would recommend approval of conditional use permit 03-15 uh, with the deletion of uh, condition two. I don't see how we can enforce that condition. Second. Any other comments? My only comment, you know, I don't disagree about the challenges of enforcing it. You know, I think it is a problem. I think the only, if there's a value in it, it does set kind of a, an understood scale to the business at the location. Um, you know, without that, I mean, it, it is somewhat, you know, wide open. And as a cottage occupation versus a, you know, a full-blown commercial site, I think, you know, it makes sense to have some levels or limitations. I mean, I don't think if somebody's got six, if he's got six or seven people, that's never going to be the deal that, you know, causes a problem. It's going to be you know, if he hit some other level of success, I'm not sure how many people are out there looking at sheds every day, but, you know, if he had 20, 30 people out there on a routine basis, then that's something that could be enforced. So that would be my only concern. I mean, I'm, I wouldn't <clears throat> vote against your motion, but. I'd agree with you if it was a business that I think would draw 20 or 30 people every day. Fair enough. Any other comments? Any at all? Yes. We're ready to vote. Mr. Unger. Unger, yes. Marston, yes. Ambrose, yes. Manuel, yes. Oates, yes. Thomas, yes. Molden, yes. Kenny, no. Triplet, yes. Dunlap, yes. Moon, yes. Uh, Wilmot votes yes. And the uh, this will go to the Board of Supervisors on November the 12th. Madam Thank you. Madam Chairman, I'll need to recuse myself from items four and five of the agenda. Thank you, sir. Okay, our next item is also a public uh, hearing item. It's Woodside uh, Rezoning 07-15, Woodside Land Company, LLC, submitted by Gray Wolf, Inc., to rezone 20 acres of property from RA Rural Areas District to M2 Industrial General District with property. <coughs> the property is located on the southern side of Route 669, Woodbine Road, about 2,000 feet east of Route 11, 
and adjacent to the Winchester and Western Rail Railroad and is identified by property identification number 34A-6D in the Stonewall Magisterial District. Mr. Ruddy. Thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the Planning Commission. On the screen to your left is the property that you just described, and of course this is the 20-acre parcel for which the applicant is requesting a rezoning from the RA district uh, to the M2 district, the Industrial General District. You can see from this next map uh, where it is in relationship to some of the properties surrounding it, in particular to the west that are already zoned M1 light industrial on the north and south side of Woodbine Road. To the north is the Semples property, and to the south is the industrial property that's currently used by Frederick County Public Schools. This property, as you pointed out, is on the east side of the Winchester and Western Railroad tracks. It's south of Woodbine Road, and you can see as we zoom on in a little bit closer there, um, Woodbine Road as it crosses the railroad tracks, heads east, crosses Duncan's Run, and then makes a sharp right-hand turn, followed by a left-hand turn in the vicinity of the frontage of this property where the entrance would be located. And what the applicant has done with this request is provided just a rough generalized development plan, which uh, is very straightforward for this 20-acre parcel, but it clearly shows the Woodbine Road right-of-way. It shows Duncan Run and the associated floodplains uh, along each side of Duncan Run. It also highlights uh, the proposed entrance location <coughs> and the hatched area that I'll point out, which was a proffer um, for an easement for a potential well site should it be determined that that's a viable site in the future. A relatively straightforward request. Um, however, there are some, some issues, if you will, that go with any request, in particular this one. The applicant's proffers, I'll just run through very briefly. Uh, the applicant has proffered a maximum development of 102,500 square feet of building area on the site. Um, the relevance of that is that that is the um, square footage that was modeled in the transportation impact analysis, the TIA, for this request. So the applicant has tried to uh, maintain that, that level of development and understanding the, the traffic impacts. Now, the proffers have also included a 75 cents per building square foot proffer for transportation to be used for transportation improvements in the general area. No particular transportation improvements have been actually identified, but that is money that would be available to some <laughs> in the area. Another proffer is a 10 cents per building square foot contribution for fire and rescue services in the area. And as I mentioned, the applicants also proffered an easement for public use for a production well if it's determined to be viable in the future. <clears throat> so those are the proffers that the applicant has provided. We recognize that the land use itself, the industrial land use designation is consistent with the comprehensive plan, but it's important to recognize some of those impacts that are anticipated with this request that may not be fully addressed with the applicant's proffer statement. Um, primarily, they revolve around transportation, and I'll hit on those, and if we have any questions too, Mr. Bishop's here that can also talk about the transportation associated with this request. But first and foremost, I think it's important to recognize the condition of Woodbine Road, Route 669, in the vicinity of this project. If you now there, obviously, we know that uh, the road is relatively rural in condition, includes a low water bridge crossing of Duncan Run, and includes some pretty uh, significant uh, turns in the road in the, across the frontage of this property. So <clears throat> that's important to recognize. Long term, the comprehensive plan identifies a major collector road, Woodbine Road, extending east from its current location with development. However, that development is, of course, on the property, property to the north, uh, not owned by this applicant. So the potential cash, cash contribution of 75 cents per building square foot has the ability to generate up to, but no more than $76,000 for transportation improvements in that general area. Recognizing the scale of that and the cost of transportation improvements, that potential amount doesn't appear to address the improvements that may well be needed to the road and to um, <clears throat> other transportation solutions in the general area recognizing that other projects as we head out to 81, Route 11, Woodbine Road, Semples, may well um, bring some of those improvements online at some point in the future. Um, they're, of course, not in the works presently. So recognizing 
uh, the conformance of the comprehensive plan from a land use perspective, but some of the impacts, in particular the transportation impacts. Um, the Planning Commission should ultimately uh, provide a recommendation following the public hearing on this particular request. I'd be happy to answer any questions that the Planning Commission may have. Again, Mr. Bishop is here. If we need to go into the transportation a little bit more. Uh, but Mr. Tim Stowe is here tonight representing this application. Thank you. Any questions? Mike? Any? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Stowe, would you like to address us now? Or Mr. Bishop? One or the other? As needed. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> As Mr. Reddy said, this project was scaled to uh, to be able to work with the transportation network that's in place out there. In fact, our goal was to not generate more than 100 vehicles, uh, 100 trips during the peak hour. We realize that the roadway is um, as small as windy. We also realize there's uh, M1 land out there that's being used presently with uh, Frederick County Public Schools and, and other uses. Uh, but we feel like this modest uh, level of traffic uh, is not going to overtax the roadway. And uh, the roadway has plenty of width uh, to navigate through the curves and the uh, amount of, of traffic that will be generated with this scale of development uh, could certainly be handled on the roadway. In fact, all the levels of service on Woodbine Road and at the intersection of Martinsburg Pike uh, reported out to be acceptable, CBA. So we didn't feel like there was a problem with Woodbine Road. I would say there are constraints on what we can do, and those were shown on uh, one of the slides Mr. Ruddy showed, and that's in the form of a, a stream and its associated floodplain and wetlands, uh, where it would be very difficult to do roadway improvements on this property owner's uh, property. And that's why the, the master plan for the area shows uh, the developments occurring to the north. The intent was for this monetary contribution to help with those improvements when the time comes to do those, but to scale this project down and to throttle it back so that the traffic here does not uh, overtax the roadway system. With that said, I'd be glad to answer any questions that I may. I am pinch hitting, so please don't ask me any hard questions. <laughs> the traffic, uh, the 100 units, is that truck traffic, a mixture, or? Generally speaking, in, in a uh, development of this type, about 8% of the traffic is trucks, and the balance of it is either employees or, or customers who may be coming and driving their car or, or a pickup truck. So, Is this a warehouse? Yes, sir. That's the type of use it'll be. Okay. Mr. Mullen. Just a quick question, uh, Mr. Stowe. What was the basis for the, for the 75 cents? for that value? That had been used in some previous um, projects that had come before the Commission and the Board of Supervisors, and, and that was the basis of it. Thanks. Any other questions? Anybody? Yes, Mr. Thomas. Yeah. I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm a little concerned on the traffic impact, uh, your, your, your view of the traffic impact. Uh, you say 8% would be multi-axle vehicles, tractor trailers, I guess. The, the road as it looks now, the condition it's in, would it structurally be able to sustain even 8% of tractor trailer traffic without significant maintenance occurring repeatedly? And uh, especially when you have part of it in a floodplain, that, that's a very uh, problematic situation because, it, you know, even if it doesn't flood, there's going to be times when it's going to be structurally impaired because of water in the, the base. Right. And I just don't see that, that road, that area, being able to take tractor-trailer traffic. Uh, and they'll tear it up extremely quickly. And even if you say customers coming in, car traffic's not too bad. Even pickup traffic, when you start loading them up, and multi-axle pickups, uh, stake bodies, when you start loading them up, they'll they'll tear that road up pretty quickly. And, you know, unfortunately, the taxpayers are the ones that are going to have to fix the road. So what's your view of that? Have, have you looked at that and analyzed it at all? 
We, we have not done any type of analysis of the soil conditions or the pavement that's out there in place, but what I would tell you is at present, uh, there are trucks accessing the Frederick County warehouse there on a regular basis. And there's also agricultural traffic using this road on a, on a regular basis, which is potentially heavier than, than what you would get with a, with a tractor trailer on the road. So uh, we know that's using the road and we know the road is holding together under those circumstances. Well, actually, the contact pressures of a, of a tractor trailer are, are higher than a wagon or mm -hmm. vehicle. Most farm traffic, unless you're talking about big combines or something like that. But I mean, that's even a problem sharing the road with farm traffic and <coughs> trailers. I mean, is this an appropriate use there, or is it an appropriate uh, transportation system to accommodate the use? Well, based on a comprehensive plan, it would appear that. that that's the direction the county uh, has decided to go, and uh, and this is in keeping with that comprehensive plan. So uh, it would seem that it is. Yes, I understand your concern. Any plan you... may envision traffic improvements, so transportation improvements. Okay, I'll ask Mr. Bishop. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else for Mr. So? Yes, Mr. Unger. Just a comment. Uh, with us using the seventy-five cents per square foot. It's what we've been doing in the past. I don't know how you could expect someone to do anything different and that they've got something to go by and it sounds like what they're doing. I mean, what do you want? 95 cents? Do you want $2? It, to me, if we've been accepting that, that's what it looks like we would do now. But that's just an opinion. Well, if it's, a, if it's on a basis, I, I would agree with you, with the exception of as time goes on, things get more expensive. And I'm not sure, you know, if that 75 cents was five years ago or 10 years ago, that's probably a dollar and a half or two dollars now. It, I remember them. It hadn't been that long ago. <laughs> Anyone else? Mr. What's the speed limit on that road now? What, is it 55, 45? Didn't we I believe it's 45, yes. Okay. okay. Any other questions of Mr. Stowe? Questions of Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. So. <coughs> yes, ma'am. I mean, my my question <laughs> goes back to is the use to and is it traffic going to be too intensive that it's going to require an extensive amount of maintenance on that section of road? <clears throat> um, not having actually done cores of the roadway and, and, and that sort of thing, I, I hate to speak to what I don't know as a fact as far as what that specific piece of pavement can or can't handle. What I'm pretty confident saying is I doubt that that road was built to the standard that VDOT would require for that type of a use if you were building a new road today. So uh, I'd say your concern is valid. Um, I'll say I don't necessarily know the actual answer to it when you consider the distance between this development, <clears throat> pardon me, and Route 11 itself, um, but it, it is a valid concern and likely a reality. Anyone else? Anyone else? Mr. Bishop, can you comment on rail issues? I can sure try. Yes. Um, I did go out and look at the site, and I looked down the track, and here were rail cars lined up, and the track is straight as a die. And the question is, if this is an M2 piece, if, if the rezoning is to M2, which is our heavier industrial yes. uh, category, then this site would be a, a dandy candidate for a rail siding, if a rail siding can be put on it with a length of its its uh, boundary I would, I would just throw that out I, I would say that's that's accurate um, the, the length looks good uh, we've obviously had another one just down the road not that long ago that's actually I believe down there at CSX I, I think by the time you get up here we're actually Winchester and Western I'd have to double check that piece and of course there are rail access funds available through the state to assist in such a project right. which we would love to be a part of so right, right. anybody else just another comment. Yes. Uh, I don't know who pulled off the place to 
for the well, but it's it's appreciated if it does pass. Mm -hmm. It's something much needed in the county. Okay. Thank you. This is a public hearing. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak to rezoning 07-15? Anyone at all? Well, then we will close the public hearing. Uh, we have a uh, we have a uh, rezoning in a magisterial district whose representatives are not able to make a motion. So we'll have to share whatever motion it is with someone else. Sir. My name is John White. I'm the applicant. I would be glad to answer questions if you would like me to. All right. Are there any questions of Mr. Light? John White, I'm the applicant. I'd be glad to answer any questions or explain a little bit to you. Mike, could you pull up the map from Route 11? And, uh, to address the rail issues, currently it's Winchester and Western. Take me out to Route 11. I'll do that. I've got that one out. That's as far as we go. That's good enough. Um, it's Winchester and Western Railroad. Last year they put they wanted a siding to be able to stack empty cars. Um, so they basically came in and put a second rail line as a stacking parking area that ran about 2,000 linear feet down my property. Since then, they've finished that one. Now they're doing a third one on the west side. So there is significant parking there uh, for Winchester and Western Railroad. Uh, the, there is an ability to hook on to that rail site and state funding is available to be able to do that. Um, to answer some of the questions about Woodbine Road, from the railroad west to Route 11 has been upgraded to tractor trailer status, so to speak. Uh, that was done back probably 15 years ago. It was widened approximately 18 inches on each side and then capped. So the parcel, the amount of roadway that we're looking to address through the proffer is from the railroad to the turn, which is a not a very long distance. If you want to take into consideration the whole road from my property out to Route 11, there are uh, proffers in place um, from the Simples property that does address um, upgrading that road intersection. There is uh, other road that makes a right, goes through the Simples property and comes into, it's a collector road, comes in straight into the red light at Rest Church Road. I did agree to the 75, 76 cents because it was used uh, just right up the road from me on a rezoning that was there about two years ago. And also another rezoning in the past 12 months out on the south end of the county. Uh, as an applicant, I have to assume that you all use a guide to go by um, through your model, impact model. So if that is the two of the last examples that are out there, then naturally I have to say that's what I'm going to go with. Uh, as far as um, do I have an intention of doing anything, um, no. I also live there, I also farm there. Um, I don't. I want to be able to sell land and retire because that's my 401k at some point. It takes years for the wheel of industrial development to happen. So I'm starting now before I get too old. Um, if you want me to address tractor trailer traffic, if in the impact, in the TIA, they're calling eight trips per day in tractor trailer traffic, I already do that. Um, and yes, our loads were probably heavier than any other load that would come in there on a tractor trailer because we're running full weight every time we go in out of that road. Um, 
there is no comparison to the road whatsoever. Would it need to be upgraded? Yes, but the part I'm speaking of is from the corner to the railroad, which is a very small distance. So that was the reason for that. Be glad to answer any more questions that you all have. Thank you, sir. Hmm? Well, John, I mean, you, you even say that it would need to be upgraded from the corner to the railroad. Uh, would you expect when you sell the property for those folks to upgrade it or? Yes. But bear in mind also that there's another 180 acres there. I got to crawl before I can walk. <laughs> In order to be able to do this, I have to start somewhere. And I used what I thought was the perfect examples of everything. And as I sat here for 20 years, if somebody said 100 trips per day on a TIA, that's about the lowest I've ever <clears throat> heard. And I think you'd have to agree with that. <laughs> that's pretty minimal impact. And I go back and say, I want to live there. I farm there. This is a useless piece of agricultural pro of, of ground. It is uh, rocky beyond farmable condition. It's deserving of asphalt. <laughs> so I, I don't know how else to tell you any better. I don't have any intentions of really doing anything at this yet, at this state. I'm just taking a first step, um, meeting the average across the board of what we saw that the county was accepting and saying, yeah, I'm willing to pay my way, <clears throat> pay my share. The big question comes into play is what is the use of the simplest property and how intense is that? Because that will also modify that road. Won't modify the section from the railroad to my property. But I'd kind of like to live there and see what happens and be glad to help as, as I need it. But there again, I have to assume that you you, the county, come up with those numbers to accept from other applicants. When you go buy a car, you don't offer the dealer another $200 because you like him. <laughs> Did I answer your question? Yeah, but you don't take a cut price because you like him either. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> All righty. Um, back to the subject at hand, and we have a uh, rezoning in front of us that we need to deal with. Madam Chair. Sir. I move to approve rezoning application 00715 Woodside Land Company. Second. Any other comments? <coughs> yes. I think this is a good use of the property. It's a good rezoning. I think the transportation proffers are woefully inadequate. It just bothers me that uh, we would uh, take this low of transportation proffers for a 20-acre parcel that uh, is going to generate and need more transportation improvements than that $78,000. That's probably a third of what it should be. At, at best, it's a third of what it should be. And, uh, it's, uh, you know, I don't remember the other two cases where we took the same amount, uh, whether they're similar or not similar, that you know we could look at that. But uh, I, I think the transportation for offer is just woefully inadequate to rebuild that section of road. What is he saying? <laughs> it has to be rebuilt in the future. Seventy-five thousand dollars won't even get it started. That's it. Uh, but here's the thing. Anyone else? They haven't identified what they have a motion on the floor. Any other comments to the motion? Madam Chair, I think it's a good application. I think it's a good rezoning. We've got to start somewhere to get some more industrial land. We've run out of it. We need to track M2 land's great. It's, it's industrial. It's jobs. I think it's great. I appreciate him coming forward and putting it forward to us. Anyone else? Can we vote? Vote yes. Dunlap, yes. Triplett, yes. Kenny, yes. Molden, no. Thomas, no. Manuel, yes. Ambrosia, no. 
Marston, yes. Hunger, yes. And the chair votes yes. This will go to the Board of Supervisors on uh, November the 12th. Our next item is also rezoning at 08-15 of McCann Office Park, submitted by Gray Wolf, Inc. to rezone 154.9 <coughs> acres as follows, 43.7 from RA Rural Areas to RA Rural Areas with proffers, 2.1 acres from RA Rural Areas to B2 General Business uh, uh, District, 11.7 uh, acres from RA Rural Areas District to M1 Light Industrial and 93.2 acres from RA Rural Areas District to OM Office Manufacturing District with proffers. The property is located in the southeastern side of Martinsburg Pike, Route 11 and Old Charlestown Road, Route 761 and is identified by property identification numbers 44-A, 25A, 44-A, 25B, and 44-A-40 uh, in the Stonewall Magisterial District. Mr. Ruddy. Thank you again, Madam Chairman, members of the Planning Commission. Uh, the rezoning itself looks quite complicated with the breakdown of acreages and, and uh, zoning districts, but I'll point it out that that breakdown is consistent with the updated land use plan for that area that was worked on uh, within the past couple of years, which called for OM in that area, in addition to uh, some small commercial in support of it, plus a wide variety, if you will, of open space uh, that address the historic resources in, in that area. The property is identified with the bold line on the screen to your left, and as you can see, the location that you just described, it's south of Old Charlestown Road, just east of Route 11, and uh, on both sides, if you will, of McCann's Road in that area. I'll also point out that in the southern portion of the property, highlighted with the red, is the right of way for future Route 37. So that's a, a consideration with this particular request. It gives you the orientation of the property. The second map shows you the adjacent uh, zoning. Some of it is rural areas, but you'll see there to the south and east, um, an industrial designation that is the Greystone project that was rezoned probably four or five years ago. And just to the west between this property, the creek and Route 11 is a little bit of RP, and that's the Hyatt Run condominium project uh, that was um, looked at recently by the Planning Commission and Board of Supervisors. <coughs> I mentioned the land use plan um, that the county worked on within the past couple of years, and this map on the screen to your left shows that designation, the OM designation, uh, the M1 industrial just south of Route 37, and uh, the unidentified areas, if you will, which were developmentally sensitive at the time, uh, the Hyatt Run floodplain environmental area, and just south of Old Charlestown Road in the northern part of the property, of course, the historic context is Stevenson's Depot. Again, the zoning, uh, the RA zoning that is maintained um, is consistent with the designations here identified in the land use plan for the county. Uh, what the applicant provided <clears throat> with the proffer statement was a series of maps, if you will, that identified those zoning locations. It's uh, not very clear to see as a whole, but if there are any questions about that, we can go through it. But it identifies, again, the property south of future Route 37 with the M1 designation. It identifies the Route 37 right-of-way, which, of course, is part of a dedicated proffer. It identifies the area south and north of McCann's Road with the OM designation and the area surrounding Hyatt's Run with the um, RA remaining designation. Uh, two other sheets with the result with the proper statement are on your screen to your left. Uh, the first one recognizes all of the right-of-way dedication along Route 11 North for future improvements <laughs> and Old Charlestown Road. <coughs> and uh, the different orientation, if you will, but this shows a fair amount of dedication in the future along Old Charlestown Road and also shows the future entrance, which would be a restricted entrance, which aligns directly across from the um, Cutshaw property, Bishop Amari, the rezonings that were looked at in the past from the county are lining up with that future entrance. So again, relatively consistent with the county's land use plan and the proper statement with the exhibits that I just went through identifies the location and the, the dedications associated with this request. Mentioned that the proffers uh, provide um, 
you want no restriction on the particular types of land uses. All land uses would be permitted. There is no limitation also on the actual development itself. However, you would recognize that there's a cap on the number of trips to 6,713. Again, that relates directly to the TIA that was prepared for this particular request. Fair amount more trips, but it's very, very close to Route 11 and the improvements that are already out there. Um, the areas of open space, environmental, recreational, historical identified are consistent with the plan. The applicant's proffers also include a continuation of the trail system in the vicinity of McCann's Road, building on one that you saw recently for Hyatt Run Condominium Project, which picked up if you will, the, shared, the shared commitment to do this uh, trail, trails in the area. In addition, there's a proffer that provides for some historic signage and, and extra visitor parking for anybody that may utilize uh, the trails in that area. So that's what's provided. <clears throat> and on the transportation side of things specifically, uh, the biggest one most probably is the Route 37 right-of-way dedication, and that's recognized in the proffer statement. I highlighted all of the additional dedication. Um, access to this site is going to be from McCann's Lane. The applicant, uh, through the comp plan exercise, and, and very particularly through the rezoning exercise, worked closely with VDOT to get VDOT's uh, endorsement of the approach to access this property. And it was determined to be McCann's Lane accessing on, on Route 11 in that area. Now, currently, McCann's Lane is of no standard to support it. However, this applicant's proffer statement provides the commitment to improve McCann's Lane to a standard that can support the industrial traffic. In addition, it includes um, signalization out there on Route 11, if you will. And I will point out that in addition to the signalization and the improvements to McCann's Lane, those transportation proffers, we do have another proffer, and I'll clarify that it's actually 10 cents per building square foot for a fire and rescue contribution. That's been a consistent contribution, but I'll point that out. That is, a, of course, what's in the proffer statement. I inflated that slightly in the staff report, and that was just a emission of a decimal point, but I'll clarify that that's point uh, one zero ten cents per building square foot for fire and rescue. Um, as I mentioned, the land, use the land use with this request is consistent with a comprehensive plan, and the impacts associated with the request, in particular the transportation ones, have generally been um, addressed, particularly to the satisfaction of VDOT. So uh, there may well be a, a good number of questions associated with this application, too. Be happy to try and answer them. Uh, recognizing Mr. Bishop is here also, if you have any specific transportation questions. And likewise, Mr. Tim Stowe is here representing the applicant tonight. Any questions, Mr. Ruddy, at this point? Thank you, uh, Mr. Stowe? Thank you and good evening again. We feel this project is uh, a good balance of development property uh, that we can use to bring industrial uh, base to, to grow the industrial base here in the county to preserve green areas that will benefit uh, the community there and to provide the transportation improvements that are needed to support this. And in conjunction with those transportation improvements that have been proffered by others uh, and those that are planned, we feel like uh, this is a fit and a win-win for the county and for the landowner. So I would be glad to answer any questions uh, that I may. Again, I'm pinch hitting. Uh, although I did prepare the traffic study, I'd be glad to, to answer any questions that I might. Questions of Mr. Stowe? Yes. On uh, page two of four of an email that uh, you sent back to uh, VDOT and John Bishop and a number of folks. Uh, number five, there seems to be some disagreement on the proposed cross-section, whether your proposed cross-section in figure seven is adequate for a commercial roadway serving the intensity of the development. Uh, your response back to that was, the, the I guess the comment says it's not adequate from VDOT. Your response back says it is adequate. Did you and VDOT ever agree on your answer to that? There, there's two components to that. Once at the intersection, we anticipate two uh, turn lanes, one for southbound Route 11, one for northbound Route 11, plus the inbound or the eastbound uh, 
lane for traffic coming into the development. That area would be 36 feet. What I'm referring to is once we clear the area where the queue would occur, our intent would be to narrow the pavement down to two lanes rather than carry the three lanes all the way back. In that area, it would be 24 feet. I understand so I think, that's your intent, but did VDOT agree to that? Uh, I have no response back from VDOT to my responses. So the short answer is it's both 36 and 24. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone else? Thank you, Mr. Stowe. Would anyone like to ask Mr. Bishop any transportation questions? Always. If VDOT and the developer don't agree on this, which way does it go? VDOT says it should be 36 foot, the developer says no, it should be 24. Depends on if the developer wants it to go into the state system or not. <laughs> okay, so, so the VDOT has the ultimate hammer on that. Yeah, that's, I'll call it a velvet hammer, but yeah, yeah, there's, uh, I'm, I'm sure they can find they can find an accord, and I believe what Mr. So said likely satisfies. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, if you want a road to come into the state system, you're going to do what VDOT wants to do. Okay. Just wanted to make sure that was the answer. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. This is a rezoning. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak to uh, rezoning 08-15 McCann Office Park? Anyone? Anyone at all? Seeing no one, we will close the public hearing. Uh, let's see here. I do. If there is no one going to speak anything for or against it, I would recommend approval of 08-15 McCain Office Rips Park. Is there a second? Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded to uh, recommend uh, rezoning. Uh, Mr. Moen? Moon, yes. Dunlap, yes. Triplet, yes. Kenny, yes. Bolden, yes. Thomas, yes. Manuel, yes. Ambrosia, yes. Marston, yes. Hunger, yes. And the chair votes, yes. This will also go to the board on November the 12th. Okay. Our next item. Madam is Chairman, I'll have to recuse on the next item. Yes, sir. Thank you. Our next item is also a public hearing item. It's rezoning 09-15 Artillery Business Center submitted by Pannonia Associates to revise proffers associated with rezoning 07-08. This revision relates specifically to transportation proffers. The properties are located east of and adjacent to Shady Elm Road, approximately 4,500 feet south of the intersection of Shady Elm Road and Apple Valley Drive. The properties are identified by property identification numbers 75-A-1 and 75-A-1F in the Back Creek Magisterial District. Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Um, as noted, we are operating in the Back Creek District. This was this is a proper modification um, to rezoning um, 0807, I probably said it backwards, uh, for, for the artillery business center. Now at that time it was a single parcel. It has since been broken up into two parcels uh, with a smaller portion uh, owned by Northwestern Workshop uh, and the larger portion still owned by, owned by uh, Venture One Partners, although I believe there's been some shifting in the partners. That's immaterial to us. Um, you recall from at that time the proffers included $250,000 cash proffer toward general transportation, uh, improvements to frontage along Shady Elm Road, the addition of a northbound lane, construction of 1,100 feet of Renaissance Drive into the property heading from uh, west to east toward the railroad tracks and Route 11, uh, as well as design funding for a at grade crossing if we were able to secure one from CSX. We're dealing with CSX Railroad here. All of those sorts of things. Um, after that rezoning, we had a number of things going on both here and across the railroad tracks, uh, working with uh, Mrs. Shoemaker on her holdings over there. Uh, and we did in, in, eventually apply for revenue sharing funds. 
Um, and while over the years we've been uh, to the altar numerous times, uh, we've never quite got the agreement uh, in place uh, with this property. I don't think it's uh, due to any lack of desire or diligence on either side. It just hasn't quite fit so far. Um, so you do have a, a rezoning before you tonight, um, and that's part of the reason why, uh, from what I understand, as well as some activity that may or may not be taking place on the property to basically line things up so they can do what they need to do. Uh, with that said, apologize, I have two maps to show you. There's a second one. Um, the to, to briefly summarize the changes, as I noted, $250,000 cash for proffer towards transportation has now been removed. The additional right lane on the northbound Shady Elm has been removed. Uh, however, those have been replaced with a commitment to enter into revenue sharing. Uh, I would note that that was not previously a proffer. That was something that was operating outside the proffers. We were trying to leverage the proffers into something more. However, now we're talking about a proffer to enter into a revenue sharing agreement uh, or local agreement uh, to provide the local match uh, for the completion of Renaissance Drive from its current terminus, which is actually, <coughs> I go back to the map here. Uh, we actually, through partnership with Mrs. Shoemaker, as I mentioned previously, have already built Renaissance from uh, Valley Pike up to an intersection with Prosperity Drive. Prosperity Drive was formerly a cul-de-sac right there in the center of your screen. So that's been bumped out. As you can see, that agreement also ended up with her engaging in a land swap with some neighboring property owners and providing us the rest of the right of way to the railroad tracks. So we have those things in place. So their revenue sharing agreement as they're proffering would be from that point at which it's been completed to across the railroad tracks and on to Shady Elm Drive and an intersection there. Uh, they have limited themselves to one per building permit per parcel um, until such time as that revenue sharing agreement has been in place, put into place. Uh, the right-of-way dedication along Shady Elm Road has been removed because it's already been done. Uh, right-of-way obligation across parcel 74A68, the, what we always call the Carbaugh property, which is this property immediately south of the rezoning, uh, which is also a comp plan for industrial but not yet zoned, um, has been removed. Um, I should note that we that that was a proffer, an upon request proffer, which we, we did request it some time back. Um, just has, they've not been able to execute it. You know, for whatever reason, buyer and seller did not come together. So, strategies being changed to where they're no longer in proffering directly that right away. However, the proffer does say that as part of revenue sharing, we would look to purchase and they would be providing the match. So, another strategy to try and get that done. Um, the internal access road proffer has been removed due to a redundancy with our own ordinance. It's basically not needed, so it was removed. Uh, now, Ms. Perkins po pointed something out to me earlier today, which I ap apologize uh, for missing uh, in my uh, focus on transportation and the fact that this is largely a transportation-focused rezoning. Uh, I did miss the fact that uh, the language regarding the historical surveys of the property has been modified uh, to focus on land bay two and exclude land bay one. Uh, the problem with that is that the structure that uh, the HRAB was concerned about back at the original rezoning, they weren't even a commenter for this rezoning, um, is on land bay one. So we may need to, to iron that piece out. But uh, a smaller issue given the things that we're focused on, but I didn't want to miss that detail entirely once she pointed it out to me. Uh, moving on to our agency comments, the only other agencies uh, besides uh, your own staff uh, that was consulted is uh, the county attorney. Um, he did have some concerns about 2.2.1, uh, specifically regarding contract language. Now, I have passed that out to you since it uh, came in uh, yesterday, so that is available before you, as well as an actual signed uh, copy of the proffers. I had noted in my staff report that I was commenting on an unsigned proffer. That signed proffer is in front of you and has come in. Uh, VDOT's comment, um, while 
based on an earlier version of the proffers, they were fairly concerned. The updated proffer has led to an update updated comment, which is in your packet, uh, which sums up as cautiously satisfied. Um, I want to make sure, I, I, I know I've uh, given a fairly uh, positive staff report. Um, I want to I make sure I don't create false hope. Um, we want this road. We want it badly. It's an important part of our comprehensive plan. I think it will help us greatly um, in that area of Route 11 and particularly the Route 37 interchange. However, there are things that can go wrong. Um, the largest is what if something happens and we can't get this crossing agreement in place with CSX. Um, dealing with CSX is like trying to catch a chicken. I mean, it is not fun. <laughs> it's uh, uh, we've uh, we've been dealing with them since early on in this process, and uh, some staff has changed, and we are going to continue to work on it. And don't get me wrong; I think we can get there, but um, that's something that really is outside of the applicant's control. It's certainly outside of my control, other than you know trying to wrangle them. You know, Rocky eventually did it, so I bet I will too. So we'll get there, but. Um, the other issue is with the triggers. Um, we do have two land bays. Each land bay is allowed to pull a building permit. So there is a potential scenario where they get the right user and they never need another building permit and thus would not need to exercise that proffer to enter into a revenue sharing agreement. That's a possibility. Um, is it likely? I don't know. Look at the shape of the parcel. Maybe, maybe not. Um, so that may be something we need to look at and, and, and you know, chew through. Um, even if that were to happen, they still have that minimum proffer of constructing 1,100 feet uh, of the roadway. Um, you know, who knows what we'll get into trying to get that right of way. These guys have been trying to buy it for a few years, um, and I don't, I don't know why it hasn't happened. I'm not part of those negotiations. That's another potential hurdle. Um, I just stand here saying I can't promise that this road for sure will happen if this gets approved like it is tonight. And it's not necessarily all but because of, of what's being proffered. There's just a lot of moving parts as there are with any major road construction project. Um, we do have to have that right away to get this road because as you can see, it goes right into that parcel. Uh, so you can see that right away. And uh, our parcel's up here, the right away's down there. We've got to find a way across. So that'll be its its own chase, so to speak. So with that, I apologize for rambling. It's my habit. Uh, I can take any question you may have. Any questions for Mr. Bishop? Yes, sir. Mr. Unger. John, the reason I called you today was because I was confused with these proffers and it didn't, hadn't cleared up a whole lot for me. Uh, what's the $250,000? Why is it going away? Well, um, because they're shifting that commitment toward the revenue sharing agreement. Now, previously, if I can zoom in on the map here, let's see if I can draw some lines without messing up this whole presentation. Um, previously, uh, the proffer obligated the applicant to do design here of, a, of an at-grade crossing, assuming the county could get an at-grade crossing. Construction of roughly 1,100 foot of two lanes here. And purchase, really on our behalf, but on their own, the actual purchase of right-of-way that gets us through the rest of the way. Now, and of course they had the cash proffer and the improvements to Shady Elm. Now the proffer would be, if we can get the revenue sharing agreement in place, they're going to pay half the cost of everything all the way from A to B. Now it's back of the envelope type of chicken scratch, but I think at the end of the day we're coming out ahead. And uh, even if it didn't cost more, um, which I'm not sure it costs a lot more, but I think we're coming out a little ahead. Um, that connection is really important to us, much more so than those improvements on Shady Elm and, and the cash. Thank you. Did that help, Mr. Unger? Yes, ma'am, a whole lot. Thomas? Oh, excuse me. Mr. Oates. 
No, I didn't have any questions. No, you didn't. No, I understood. <laughs> what he said. Uh, Mr. Bishop, um, I guess going back to they could build basically one building on each lot. Yes, sir. And stop right there because who knows how much this is going to cost to build the road, especially if we end up having to get a bridge over top of the railroad tracks. I mean, then you're going to be looking at a few million dollars, I imagine. But they would still be on the hook for half of that for revenue matching? Well, the project as scoped is an at-grade crossing. Um, I don't believe this proffer obligates them to a bridge, and I believe... So if we can't get the at grade, then we're going to have to bear the brunt of the bridge, and then they would just take from the bridge. If we want, it, if we want it bad enough, yes, I think we would. Um, you never know if there are, are additional state opportunities uh, that that we could seek out, uh, but yeah, that would be the situation. Well, I guess the other question would be back to that one building permit for each lot. Would you be more comfortable if there was a timing trigger, like within five or ten years after the building permit, it has to be done instead of holding off for another building permit, or, or um, what would make you more comfortable? With? I, I wouldn't even say it would have to be that long, because to me that's a long time. The revenue sharing dollars we have, we will not have in five or ten years if we don't do a project. We won't have them in two years if we don't do a project. Um, so. so so I would be looking at a much tighter timeline. Yes, something that's more tied to time would probably be better for me. Um, I believe there is no lack of intent to enter into an agreement. Drafts have been going back and forth. They've actually recently sent a signed draft, which while not there yet in terms of some issues I had with the language, it's getting very close. Uh, so um, I see no reason why we couldn't execute an agreement. and I would hope they would agree. I would leave it to the applicant to speak to it within the next few months even, um, if that long. I really do think we're close. On the? The actual execution of the revenue sharing agreement. Right, but I'm, yes. I guess what about the aggregate crossing? Because you said that was like chasing a chicken. Who knows how long that's going to take? Well, that's CSX, you know. Um, so it could be three, four, ten years before we could ever get that? No, no, no. That's not what we're talking about in terms of timeline. The thing with CSX, um, is they start out wanting you to close three crossings to get one. That's where we started out last time. We got them down eventually to one. That guy's off to a different job. Now I'm dealing with a new guy who could care less what that guy said. And that's what CSX is like to deal with. <laughs> um, so I've been there before. I think we can get there again. Um, it's, a, it's a negotiation and it takes time. It doesn't take five, ten years. It takes probably one year or months. I mean, it just depends on how long it takes us to, to, to get the new guy singing to our sheet of music. Um, and, and that's not an easy task, but, uh, uh, but I think we will get there. I do believe we'll get there. Um, we, will we get away with closing one crossing? No, we might have to find another one to close. That's not easy, but I think it's doable. Um, so there's, there's all of those things that are factors. But uh, as far as if we all of a sudden end up with a bridge, I, I think that's probably going to end up being more than any of us at this time could, could, could take. It's, it's not palatable, um, I would think, to the applicant or to the county in terms of where to come up with that. But that's what it's like to deal with CSX, because unless you take them all the way through that, OK, we're going to let you do this, well, that's just one step. You get that sort of verbal nod and wink that, all right, we're going to move forward with this. Well, then you have to go ahead and design your facility. They have to approve that design. Then the agreement has to come in place. And when you send that agreement in, it's got to come with a big fat check. For example, the, the agreement we just executed for the bridge on uh, Greystone, that check was almost $300,000. It's not until that point that you've executed that agreement, you've gotten your design approved, you executed agreement, you sent the big fat check. Now you're vested in terms of your crossing approval. That's just how it works. Any other questions of Mr. Bishop? I thought I saw a hand down there. You okay? John. Yes, yes. sir. I'm not the smartest bull in this pen, but join the club. Um, 
Am I understanding that there could be a building built on this property with no improvements whatsoever to Shady Elm proffered? So yes. that traffic would go to Shady Elm because God only knows when we're going to get Renaissance. I mean, to build yeah. that traffic could go from that one building. And it, is it not true that you don't need to proffer to revenue share? Or am I wrong? That's true. You don't need to proffer to revenue share. You can just proffer an improvement and then if, and then come to the county and ask them to apply for rev, ask us to apply for revenue share. We can end up in a revenue sharing agreement. You don't have to proffer to, okay. to be in it. Um, you're correct. Uh, you can build on land bay one without doing any improvements beyond what a site plan would require, uh, whatever VDOT would say you have to do when you're building your entrances and things like that, turn lanes, things like that. Um, building to build on land bay two they do need to build their 1100 foot of roadway but that's still with not without going anywhere that's still an 1100 foot driveway on the shady elm road yeah uh thank you mr bishop i think it's time that we spoke with uh mr sowers yes ma'am <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the Planning Commission, Patrick Sowers with Pannonia Associates here on behalf of the application um, and representing NW Works, who, as John pointed out, owns the smaller 17-acre parcel of the site. Um, also with me tonight is Mr. Ty Lawson, who's representing Venture One that owns the other 40.6 acres um, on the property. Sorry, go back this way. So um, just to cover a couple things quickly, on the historic, um, study for historic structures on the property. Previously, the application had the front approximately 28 acres in Land Bay 1, the rear 30 in Land Bay 2. Since the property was subdivided, we've used now the 17 acres NW Works owns as Land Bay 1 and the 40.6 acres in Venture 1 owns as Land Bay 2. Here you can see where the, the property line actually jogs around the existing brick rancher that's on the property but there's a second dwelling and that's the old dwelling if you look right there that's the old structure it's within land bay two that's why the proffer's tied to development within land bay two because it's not the brick rancher we're concerned with it's the older house and that is separate and that was discussed with staff in a separate meeting that that john and bishop weren't weren't um in attendance so just want to be clear, it's within Land Bay 2, not within Land Bay 1. That's why the proffer is set up that way. Uh, secondly, kind of the big picture on what we're trying to accomplish here. When this rezoning was taken through in 2008, long term, the solution is Renaissance Drive. Make that connection to Route 11, not to send everybody up to Apple Valley Road on Shady Elm. So the proffers in 2008 had 1,100 feet on site, as <coughs> Mr. Bishop pointed out, of Renaissance Drive, and then no construction beyond that. It was, it was right of way off site. What we've tried to do is focus, instead of having efforts on Shady Elm Road, let's focus that on getting what's the actual transportation solution for the area in place, and that's Renaissance Drive. That serves that area well. It's comp plan for industrial. We want those trips to get out to Route 11, not to drive a mile up to Apple Valley Road. Um, as far as the improvements to Shady Elm, the existing proffers had a one lane across the frontage of the property. That's, this is the 2008 proffers. That was for a continuous right turn lane across the frontage. VDOT, at the entrance permit stage with site plans, we're going to have turn lanes into, there's a maximum of two entrances into the property from Shady Elm Road. Those turn lanes are going to be in place. But since the long-term focus was how do we get that connection to Route 11 through Renaissance Drive? That was the purpose of the $250,000 cash proffer in 2008. And the reason it's been removed is because now the applicant has proffered the Land Bay 2 owner specifically to enter into an agreement to make that connection a reality through the revenue sharing program. So since we know that's the long-term goal, we felt like that was a better alternative for the county. Let's not send trips up Shady Elm. Let's get them out to Route 11. Um, as far as the, the building permit and the agreement, 
One, there is the separate for offer for 1,100 feet on site. As Mr. Bishop pointed out, there's some unknowns for the agreement long term, the at grade crossing working with CSX. The way the proffer is structured beyond one building permit until that agreement's in place, you can't get another building permit. So there's, there's some give and take here where I think working closely with staff, we've tried to craft a proffer that ensures that everybody wants the road and we want to get that road built. And there's a short timeline on how long these revenue sharing funds are available. So we're hoping to do that in the short term. But how do we structure the proffer so that there's some, some help for everybody involved in the application? Um, ultimately, VDOT has said they're cautiously satisfied, but satisfied because we're going in the direction of trying to get that road segment in place. So we think this is a better application, and that's why we're before you tonight. Um, that being said, I'd be happy to answer any questions. And as I said, Mr. Ty Lawson's here on behalf of Venture One. If there's any questions for Venture One, too. Patrick, uh, you've been talking about doing 1,100 feet of, uh, it was even called a driveway tonight one time. <coughs> that is going to be Renaissance Drive someday. Yes, sir. It, it's proffered as the East West Collector within an 80 foot right of way. Give me approximately, and I don't want to be specific, about where 1,100 feet comes to off the of Shady Elm. It's, a, it's about halfway down the site. Okay. All right. Along that southern property line. Any other questions of Mr. Sowers? Mr. Sowers, take me through the, when I'm reading these VDOT letters. The September 25th letter states that they're not satisfied. Maybe I've missed something in all this trying to, to stay up with it. Where you know the existing and you know, that they're not satisfied with the transportation proffers, and then in October 13th they're cautiously satisfied. What did, what changed to make that happen? The actual proffering of entering into an agreement. Okay, that's right. Okay, that revenue sharing. Anyone else? Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. This is a public hearing. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak to us regarding this rezoning for our Dillery Business Center? Anyone at all? Well, seeing none, we will close the uh, public hearing. This is uh, in the Back Creek Magisterial District. And are there any other comments to make? Uh, Madam Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, I am. I'm overall, uh, I guess, in favor of the changes, except for the one item that there is that slight loophole that potentially they would never have to enter, to enter into the agreement if they only stop at two buildings. That's right. And they're off the hook. Uh, I mean, you could get potentially one user in there, it takes that whole pet place, use it for truck parking or something else, and it might be 20 years for the second building permits ever needed. So I'm a little concerned that. There's not some other trigger in there to guarantee that this uh, agreement will be in place when we need it. It's my only comment. Anyone else? Anyone else? Uh, uh, just to say that Gary's got a valid recommendation, but it's just looking at what's going on, and these people have been over backwards trying to get this road through here, in my opinion. And they're still putting the road in as far back as to where it doesn't make a real big dog leg in it. So I don't know what else you can ask of them. They've done everything that you want them to do. So I don't have a problem with it. Any other comments? I agree with Mr. Oates. I think that we need a trigger in there because I think, you know, it's this land's been marketed, it's been tried to be developed. I, I can't see the I just think it's gonna to be too much of a burden putting that on Shady Elm Road, right? It, without something in there to mitigate that. I I just have a hard time, you know, and it seems like the the easy parts are done. We've got right up to the railroad, now we gotta do the handle the railroad, we gotta handle the extension. Everything's in there except a trigger to what's gonna make it happen. And I know that everybody wants to see don't, but this is, you know, it's, it's, it just, I, I have to agree with Mr. Oates. I think we need something in there uh, to trigger, because I see just one building on each parcel being built, then that's it. And, and then we're dealing with Shady Elm all over again on how to handle that traffic. Yeah, 
I think that's a, a very valid concern because, I mean, just like you said, they're, they're marketing it now. We have no idea what tra what the traffic's going to be, what the makeup's going to be. And, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, probably a developer wouldn't want to come in there if they were an intensive traffic generator, knowing that their traffic has to go on Shady Elm Road. But what if somebody <coughs> We always deal with the what ifs, and uh, unfortunately, sometimes they come true. So either we ought to have a limit on traffic, or we ought to have some way to get that uh, revenue sharing earlier. I guarantee we get it. I guess I would support a, uh, a recommendation of approval with the condition that a timing trigger be incorporated in a proffer 2.21 rather than just building permit? 2.21. Uh, 2.21. Okay. Gary, clarify that for me. I'm not sure if I understand. Uh, well, right now the trigger is whenever they pull that second building permit, at that time they have to have the agreement in place. So rather than do that, say, within 24 months, 36 months, because if we need this road and the window is going to be closing, I mean, it might be three years for the first billing permit. But I think it should be a timing issue of this thing needs to be done in the next 12 months or 18 months so that we know the money's there when, when everything falls in place. Any comments about that? Well, yeah, part of this even gets more concerning when we're dealing with two potential mm -hmm. owners. We have two land bays. What if they issue the, the permit, the building permit for land bay one? He has no interest at all in the land bay two road. I, I think we need something in there like you're, like you're talking about, either you know, 24 months after they issue a permit on land bay one or 36 months, whatever folks think appropriate, but one for the second building permit, I think, is, is potentially going to be problematic. I guess what I'm thinking is not so much after the building permit, but from the date of the rezoning approval. Because, again, we're looking at a two to three year window when the funds are going to be available. So if this agreement isn't in place in the next three years, and they may not be worth anything. Yeah. That'd be fine too. I think that would be that, that's a good comment. Did you all hear that? I yes. didn't hear last to what Roger said. No, I, I think his comment about from the data rezoning is probably better than from the permit from the uh, building permit. Madam Chair, so we're going to have that wording added to this. Is that what you're saying, Gary? Uh, well, I just said I'd, I'd support a recommendation of approval if that wording was added to the motion, if it was, you know, conditioned upon that. that come back before us again, or is it going to the board with that wording? Is that how that would work? Or? You go to the board? It would go to the board and recognize that the plan commission approved it okay. conditioned upon different timing mechanism. There's a puzzlement down there on the end. Well, thinking just more about the terminology, I, I understand where, where everybody's going with it, and I, I don't disagree with the concerns. Um, you know, the, the question is whether or not it's, it's an action conditioned on that change, or is it a, a recommendation to the board that the proffers be revised or reflect, you know, that? I, I kind of defer to, to staff ultimately. Okay. Board's decision yeah, if they want to do it or decision. not. Yeah, absolutely. I know there's a timing issue also with some of these, and uh, that's why I don't want to see it held up on the tabling. No, I support I support what you're what you're proposing. Yeah, so I, I'm comfortable with that. I just want to be sure we're putting it out there in the right way for the board. Uh, Mr. Bishop. <clears throat> At risk of getting myself in trouble with smarter people than me. Um, I don't believe your your recommendation can be a contingent recommendation. You can note that the board can consider should consider an item in your opinion, but once you've made your motion, they may or may not consider it. But your specific action can't require a change. 
to a voluntary proffer. So we can make a approval with a strong recommendation of. Yes, that's just a note to the board as opposed to a contingent action. I'm fine with that. And we have that done, we have done that before. So where are we folks? I'll make a recommendation of approval to 0915 Artillery Business Center with Gary word it for me. Uh, with a strong recommendation that the timing be changed to a date uh, after rezoning and not building permits. Is that clear to the universe? I'll second that, that dual motion. <laughs> So, <laughs> we have a motion to uh, approve and also uh, to uh, strongly recommend uh, timing after rezoning for this issue to be accomplished. So, any, anyone else? Any other thoughts? Okay, Mr. Moan, would you like to vote? Moan, yes. Dunlap, yes. Triplet, yes. Any no. Bolden, no. Thomas, yes. Oates, yes. Ambrogi, yes. Marston, yes. Hungry, yes. And the chair votes, yes. This will go to the board on the 28th of October. Okay. Thank you. Our next item is also a public hearing item. It is an ordinance amendment to the Frederick County Code, Chapter 165 zoning, uh, regarding Article 4, Agricultural and Residential District, Part 401, RA Rural Areas District. To cut to the chase, this is a revision to the Frederick County Zoning Ordinance to include self-storage facilities as a conditional use in the rural area zoning district. Mrs. Perkins. Thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the commission. As you stated, this is a public hearing for an ordinance amendment to include self-storage facilities as a conditional use in the RA, which is the rural areas district. Currently, that use is only permitted in the B2, B3, M1, and M2 districts by right. Um, I would note this was a request um, for discussion just due to the fact that this use requires limited infrastructure and therefore it may be appropriate in certain locations due to its, um, it doesn't need a lot of public infrastructure. So the way the ordinance has been drafted um, for the CUP, there are a number of existing supplementary use regulations that already apply to self-storage. Um, those would apply as well as the developments first would need to conform to all B2 standards, which is your parking and your landscaping. The development would need to have access onto a paved state road. And um, third, the property would need to be located within a designated and defined rural community center as identified in the comprehensive plan. Now that third bullet was added after the Board of Supervisors discussion. They had a number of concerns about the self-storage being located within various areas in the, in the RA district that it wouldn't be appropriate. So we limited it a little bit more for the public hearing. So the DRC discussed this back in July. It came before you as a discussion at your August meeting and the board at their September meeting. So tonight we are seeking a recommendation from the commission to forward to the Board of Supervisors on this proposed addition. Is there a question of Mrs. Perkins? Yes, sir, Mr. Oates. Uh, I have two. One, uh, I guess, uh, conform to all B2 district standards. Uh, is that where a site plan requirement would be, or is this an illustrative sketch scenario? This would be a site plan. All right. Uh, and the second one is I, I don't agree with the rural community center uh, designation, particularly since those are generally pretty tiny lots in our rural centers where a mini storage really wouldn't be appropriate it'd be more appropriate in areas where you have five acre lots something where the neighbors aren't going to be that close uh putting this in you know out in the small lots of alban or right in the middle of gore amongst all the housing just makes no sense to me uh if anything we ought to discourage them from going in those tight communities and put them out in areas where they'll be i guess lost or are not seen from the road they can be uh, shielded so I'm I'm not in favor at all of that uh, I'm fine with the ordinance as far as allowing mini storage and RA but uh, definitely not with that designation uh, that requirement okay. 
Okay, Mr. Thomas has expressed an agreement. <coughs> I see other heads nodding. Uh, someone like to make a motion? This is a public hearing, so we do need. Oh, excuse me. It is a public hearing. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak to this change to the ordinance? Anyone? All right. We will uh, close the public hearing now. <coughs> we need a recommendation. I'll make a recommendation that we approve the ordinance. Uh, with a strong recommendation <laughs> <laughs> that uh, the requirement that it be designated and defined within rural community centers as identified in a comprehensive plan be stricken as those areas would probably be inappropriate for this. I'll second that and then I'll, I'd like to ask staff. Do we have to make, since this is an internal uh, document, uh, it's not a proffer from somebody else, does it have to be a strong recommendation or can we delete that as a condition of our approval. Either way, it doesn't matter. I'd rather see us delete it as a condition. Uh, delete it. Uh, glad to modify my uh, right. motion. And I'll second the modified motion. All right, so we have a motion to approve and uh, to remove the item dealing with placing these in rural community centers. Okay. Um, all righty. Mr. Unger. Unger, yes. Marston, yes. Ambrogi, yes. Manuel, yes. yes. Thomas, yes. Molden, yes. Kenny, yes. Triplet, yes. Dunlap, yes. Moon, yes. And the chair votes, yes. This will also go to the board on uh, November the 12th. All right. The next item is also an ordinance amendment to the Frederick County Code, Chapter 165 Zoning, Article 10, Board of Zoning Appeals. And again, we cut to the chase because this is dealing with a revision to the Frederick County Zoning Ordinance to revise and update the variance requirements per the Code of Virginia. Mrs. Perkins. Again, thank you. Uh, during the 2015 session, the Virginia General Assembly passed amendments to the Code of Virginia pertaining to the operation of local Board of Zoning Appeals. Now, these, due to these changes, there are a number of zoning ordinance uh, modifications that are required to bring our code in conformance with the state code changes. So really what the specific changes include, first, there's a revised definition of variance. Uh, second, there's some changes to the administrative appeals sections. Um, the, one of the other changes within section C, it's the modification of the term unnecessary hardships. That's been now replaced with the phrase unreasonable restriction on the utiliz utilization of property. <laughs> and there's some other um, really just move movement of text just to conform with the flow of the state code. So this was discussed by the DRC, the Planning Commission, and the Board. And so tonight we are seeking a recommendation from the Planning Commission to the Board of Supervisors. Thank you. Questions of Mrs. Perkins. Hmm? Oh. Thank you very much. This is a public hearing. Would anyone like to speak to this ordinance amendment dealing with the variance requirements that we have? All right. We will close the public hearing. Madam Chair, I move that we recommend approval of the ordinance amendments concerning variance requirements. Second. Any other comments? Mm -hmm. Mr. Unger? Unger, yes. Marston, yes. Ambrogi, yes. Manuel, yes. Oates, yes. Thomas, yes. Bolden, yes. Kenny, yes. Triplet, yes. Dunlap, yes. Moon, yes. And the chair votes, yes. This also will go to the board on November the 12th. Okay, um, our next item is a public hearing item and it's an ordinance amendment to the Frederick County Code, Chapter 165 Zoning, Article 4, Agricultural and Residential, Residential District. And uh, again, this to the chase, this is the revision to the Frederick County Zoning Ordinance to revise the setback from parcels within the Agricultural and Forestal Districts in the RA District. Mrs. Perkins. Again, thank you. Now this ordinance amendment arose from the recent agricultural and forestal district update. Um, what happened, there were some issues that came about due to parcels that were less than five acres in size being included in the agricultural and forestal districts due to their impacts on adjacent properties. Really the issue was that someone with a small piece of property that was within an adopted agricultural district 
would have impacts on their neighboring properties due to the imposition of the 200 foot setback. So when the board held a public hearing for the inclusion of those smaller parcels, um, they deferred action on a number of those and directed staff to prepare an ordinance amendment um, so that they could adopt those parcels into the district without impacting their neighbors. So really, the, what the proposed amendment before you states, um, it utilizes the RA war areas setbacks that were adopted back in 2007. Um, those setbacks are based on the size of the adjoining properties. So what it says, parcels within an agricultural district that are six acres or less would require a 50 foot setback and parcels over six acres would require a 200 foot setback. So this is really just the, the table that would be shown in the ordinance. It shows the existing six acres or less, six acres or more, the 50 and the 100 foot. It includes then the agricultural six acres or less, six acres or more, the 50 and the 200 and it carries for the orchard setbacks, which has always been 200. So I would let the Planning Commission discuss this at your August 19th meeting. It was then forwarded to the board with the six acre requirement. The DRC discussed the ordinance amendment at their August meeting as well. However, they recommended a two acre instead of the six. When it went to the Board of Supervisors for a discussion, they um, carried forward with the six acres and that's what they sent forward to public hearing. So tonight we are seeking a recommendation from the commission to forward to the board. I would be glad to answer any questions. Any questions of Mrs. Bergens? C1. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to um, address us regarding this ordinance change? Anyone at all? Then we will close the public hearing. Mr. Oates. Uh, Madam Chairman, when the issue of uh, our concerns about these setbacks are brought up, basically every example that was shown on to us or that was proposed was basically parcels that were less than two acres. Really, they were about one acre parcels. Uh, I just see this as one of those things where you swing the pendulum, you went too far one way, and now we're going all the way up to a six acre tract on this one. You've gone too far the other. Uh, what DRC had sent forward of saying two acres basically captured every single problem it didn't need to go all the way up to the six acre requirement. Uh, I agree with that and I'm not supportive of changing all the way up to six acres. I think two acres is plenty. I kind of like the six acres. Why, why uh, hmm. I, I guess, what, what difference do you see? I mean, if somebody has a, I, personally, I don't think if you have a five acre plot, you should be in the agriculture and forestal district anyhow. <coughs> certainly shouldn't be able to control the uh, development of your neighbor's property for that 200 foot setback if you have five acres. So, uh, what do you see the, as the downside going from two to six? Well, you can put a lot of stuff on a five acre parcel. Anything from hay to orchards to corn to, you're gonna have spray materials that have to be so far from residential houses. So that's gonna dictate how far then you could uh, work that acreage. Where I live, uh, we've got 40 acres that are made up mostly of five acre parcels, but they're contiguous. Um, so that's why I don't think it needs to go above the two acre requirement because like I said, every single example that was showed was lots that were smaller than two acres. So why are we going up to six now to solve a problem that with small lots was the issue? I just think you've gone from one extreme to the other. Yep. Instead of taking care of the problem, you've you've included a lot more parcels now in this thing than and they weren't even an issue before. Well, but if you have a five acre parcel in the middle of an agricultural district and all of a sudden they want a two hundred foot setback on their neighbor's property, that this limits that to fifty foot. I, I don't, you know, I, I think we ought to protect the surrounding properties, not the five acre properties on this. I, I don't think that somebody that has five acres should be able to control what happens on his neighbor's property 200 feet from his property line. But six and, acres, you should. I guess. No, no, no. I think it should be 10, 10 acres or more. 10. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of the opposite of, of where you're going, Gary, because I, I don't, the. You know, the, the demographics of the of Frederick County are changing. We're going to get a lot more people in that are coming out from uh, more urban areas. And 
when that happens, we always get to people that like, you know, they don't want any development around them. They want to be able to sit in their backyard and watch the deer in their neighbor's yard, and they don't want their neighbor to be able to develop anything there. And I, I think the farmers need to be able to farm their land. And if we we're already taking 50 feet away from them, I don't know why we'd take 200 feet away from them. Uh, you lost because, in one sense, it sounds like you're supporting the development, not the farmer. And then your last statement was protect the farmer, not the development. Well, I'm, I'm for protecting the farmers on this on the five acre lots. So if a farmer's on five acres or less, he's not protected, but more than five, he's good. Well, I don't consider five acres or less the farm. Uh, you know, I never, I know people disagree with me on that, but I never consider that a farm. Okay. Back to the subject at hand. This was, <laughs> this was a dire uh, directed to us by the board to um, hold a public hearing on the six acre requirement. And so that's what we're dealing with. At least I presume that's what we're dealing with. That sounds good to me. Uh, for a motion. Madam Chair, I move that we recommend approval of the <coughs> amendment setbacks from agricultural and forestal pro districts. Second. Any other comments? Mr. Moan. Moan, yes. I'm Dunlap, yes. Triplett, yes. Kenny, no. Molden, no. Thomas, yes. Oates, no. Manuel, yes. Ambrogi, yes. Harston, yes. Hunger, no. And the chair votes yes. This will go to the board also on November the 12th. What, 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 what an agenda. Anyway, we have come to the end of ours. And I would like to. Um, I don't want somebody controlling me. Two hundred. Folks, he's. I need to get. We have a meeting next. Larry, I would like to advise us all that we will have a meeting on November the fourth. So make sure you have that on your skin. November the fourth. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. We will have two meetings again in November. Perhaps we may have one on the eighteenth. Yes. <coughs> He talked to a woman. Yeah, please. Aye. Thank you all very much.